Um, so as Kari uh, said, um, I'm, uh, at, I'm working at OsloMet. I'm an associate professor here. Um, I will uh, talk about moisture buffering and modern timber constructions. Um, So I'll start from uh, from the country where uh, I live and work, uh, Norway. That is a country with a long tradition in timber constructions from the very old days. Uh, but uh, moreover, it's a country that uses timber very much nowadays as well. And in particular, when it comes to uh, the solid timber, this is a, a clear effort in the last years to use more and more. Uh, apart from the tradition, there is a, the increase in the recent use of engineered timber products, the last, in particular, the last decade. It is not only due to it is not only due to the tradition, but it is also due to the fact that in Norway, due to the strict national framework for energy use in buildings, the country has achieved a dramatic reduction of energy use for heating since 90s. So the goal, the two challenges and the goals nowadays is actually to ensure high indoor environmental quality in the highly insulated and airtight building envelopes, and moreover to um, proceed further with the decarbonization of the buildings sector, which uh, to large extent in the new energy efficient buildings, it is related strongly to uh, the embodied energy and the bandit emissions in the building materials. Um, the typical light timber construction is something that very well known and has been used in many countries. It is consists uh, of uh, a wooden stands as a frame and then insulation, uh, air barrier and uh, vapor barrier and exterior and interior cladding. The interior wooden cladding is usually soft wood and uh, is a thin boards of 12 or 14 millimeters thickness and almost always is uh, painted. They're painted. Uh, in contrast, uh, when we refer to modern timber constructions, we have started talking more and more about solid timber constructions. And this might be glue lamp beams that is used for structural uh, as structural elements, or it might be um, uh, CLT elements, cross laminated timber elements, panels that uh, they, they, they can be used both, both for non structural and structural purposes. And not least, it can be a modern version of, log, of logs used um, uh, in particular for, uh, um, for uh, cabins. Clearly, the CLT is the one that leads the last decade or 15 years, the woodification of the building industry. Uh, here on the left, you can see um, um, a typical uh, section of um, a typical section of a CLT wall, uh, where you can also observe that usually when we use CLT, we don't use a vapor barrier because the uh, water vapor diffusion resistance factor of the of the CLT is considered adequate. Otherwise, we use a weather resistive barrier and air barrier on the exterior side of uh, the insulating layer. The solid timber it's uh, either exposed or covered by gypsum board. The latter is uh, usually due to uh, the requirements for fire against fire. In that case, um, one of the side of the of the of the of the solid timber wall might be covered by gypsum board while the other is exposed. If not gypsum board are used and the CLT is completely exposed, then usually it's treated with a diffusion open Osmo oil. Uh, the thickness of the solid timber elements might vary from uh, 60 millimeters to 140 millimeters. Um, controlling the relative humidity indoors uh, Esvere has already introduced that, has talked about that, and also Penk later will talk mostly about the ventilation strategies connected to that. But uh, we can summarize that we have to, we can use the demand control ventilation like moisture control where we set a, a level of relative humidity as maximum or minimum. 
we can humidificate or dehumidificate. We can use uh, balanced ventilation with uh, uh, additional moisture recovery, additional to the heat recovery. We can, of course, adjust respectively the uh, air temperature indoors, and we can also use moisture buffering in hygroscopic surfaces indoors, such as building materials, furnaces, etc. Um, but talking about moisture buffering, probably uh, the mind of all of us goes back to 2005 almost, and the NUR test project that was, uh, uh, in my opinion, at least one of the uh, fundamental projects within the area. It was a project that was uh, run by uh, the Technical University of Denmark, having uh, as partners uh, Sintef, uh, the Technical Research uh, Center of Finland, VTT, and the Lund University in Sweden. Uh, what is moisture buffering, as you can see also in this figure, is that uh, the hygroscopic materials, the hygroscopic surfaces, can buffer the maxima and the minima of relative humidity, the relative humidity variations, as also I mentioned. Uh, in contrast to the non-hygroscopic or tight surfaces. In that case, using the hygroscopic materials, we can, we can lead the relative humidity lay within the accepted limits as described in the standards. An important parameter when we talk about moisture buffering is the moisture buffer value. And this is actually the moisture uptake expressed in grams divided by the change in relative humidity due to the, the internal uh, humidity load, divided also by the hygroscopic surfaces that is active and participate in the buffering. So uh, in order to, so that someone can they can determine the moisture but it needs to, to uh, run some moisture protocol which, where the relative humidity varies from 33% to 75% and then measure the moisture uptake in the hygroscopic surfaces. In the NUR test project, uh, the, they determined the moisture buffer value of different materials as you can see on the right-hand side uh, figure. So in this one, you can see, for example, that the spruce boards have uh, the highest moisture buffer value, which is approximately 1.2 gram per square meter per uh, change of relative humidity in percentage. Um, but uh, talking about the moisture buffering, we need to know actually what is the, the potential humidity low in, in indoors in order to, to the, so that can be buffered in the hygroscopic surfaces. So the, the internal humidity can be defined by the sum of the external humidity plus the moisture excess. And the moisture excess, it is described by the ratio of the moisture production expressed in grams per hour divided by the ventilation rate expressed in cubic meters per hour. Alternatively, if we don't know the moisture production indoors, then we can assume that the moisture excess for residential buildings might be as described in the standard ISO 13788, it can be either four or six gram per cubic meters at maximum, uh, which refers to the humidity class two and three. There are uh, sources uh, that, uh, there are literature sources that show moisture sources indoors, typical moisture sources indoors, as well as standards, for example, uh, the German national standard or uh, the ASHRAE standard. And this is one of the important parameters in order to uh, determine the moisture excess, while the other important parameter is the ventilation rate. So very little uh, moisture production indoors will lead to in insignificant moisture buffering, while very high ventilation strategies will also lead to very low moisture excess and therefore to insignificant moisture buffering. So the question when it comes to the modern way of using solid timber in, in our buildings is to what extent we can make those two parameters, the moisture buffering and the ventilation strategies, work in collaboration and not against each other. I will uh, share now with you four, uh, uh, some findings from four different studies where we can use as a basis further on for our discussion. 
So the first one is some field investigations, which is about the, the behavior of silt under some extreme moles to load compared to non-hygroscopic surfaces. This is, a, a, I would say, an old study that we did some years ago. It was a part of a Norwegian research project uh, led by the Norwegian Institute of Wood Technology. It was uh, um, some investigation that was done in um, uh, CLT modules that, was, uh, that are still located at uh, the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, a bit outside Oslo. And um, this, that you, this, the condition of, this, of, the test, uh, uh, of the test modules nowadays is not the one that you see in the, in the pictures, but is the one that you see in the picture down, which is uh, also insulated and uh, double layer of weather resistive barrier. Um, in these uh, modules, there is a, a exhaust only exhaust ventilation used of uh, 0.5 air exchange. And uh, in the, in, under the experimental investigation, we use very, very high um, uh, moisture load, uh, which was uh, 0 0.62 kilos per hour, which corresponds to for uh, a humidification uh, period that we use, which corresponded to approximately 5.8 kilos. This, if someone calculates the moisture excess, corresponds to a very high load of an, a delta V higher than 20 grams per cubic meter. Uh, here you can see um, some results uh, where compared the exposed CLT with um, uh, the module that had non-hygroscopic surfaces. And what we can see is that uh, uh, despite the very high moisture excess, the max relative humidity in the, in the first module with the exposed CLT, it was 70%, while in the non-hygroscopic, it was the maximum 95%, very high, as also expected. The second study is a lab investigation of the moisture buffering performance of CLT under control operational conditions. So in this one, it was, uh, it was an investigation that consisted of, two, consisted of two steps. In the first step, we first investigate, determine the moisture buffer value of, a, of um, a Norwegian CLT element. And we did that in order to uh, validate the, the findings of uh, the NUR test. And moreover, because in the NUR test it was used some uh, small wooden samples, while here we wanted to use the whole CLT panel. So what we can report as moisture buffer value for this element, it was more or less the same as found in the NUR test, which was something expected and was 1.1 gram per um, square meter per uh, change in the relative humidity. Uh, also, in addition, we run a test where we simulate um, in the climate chamber, we simulate uh, outdoor conditions. So um, minus 8.5 degrees and the relative humidity of 70%, uh, which is an absolute humidity of 1.7 and indoors, typical temperature of 21.5 and a relative humidity of 20%, which, is, which gives a, an, an absolute humidity of 3.5 grams. Uh, the, the ventilation that was used in that case, it was approximately um, 1.5 air exchange an hour, which was corresponds to a specific ventilation rate of uh, something less than four. And uh, we run three different scenarios of moisture load. We run uh, a moisture load uh, uh, with uh, 270 grams per hour, with uh, 312.5 and uh, with uh, 345 grams per hour. And what we saw is what's that in the first case, the expected increase of humidity indoors, if we consider the moisture load and the ventilation rate, it should have been 4.7 grams which was corresponds to a relative humidity of 45%. Instead, the actual increase of relative humidity was only 3.54, which corresponds to a relative humidity of 40%. So the corresponding ventilative effect of moisture buffering in that case, it was 18.4 cubic meters per hour, while the total ventilation effect, if we sum the moisture buffering and uh, the ventilation was uh, 76, 76 uh, cubic meters per hour. Um, in the same way, 
when we calculate for the higher moisture load, then we find out that instead of having 5.4 gram per cubic meter, which would correspond to a relative humidity of 50%, we had instead an actual increase of humidity indoors by 3.7 gram per cubic meters, which would correspond to a relative humidity at 41%. In that case, the ventilative effect of moisture buffering is 27 cubic meters per hour, and the total ventilation summing the moisture buffering and the, uh, and the, vent and the ventilation is 84.5. In the highest moisture load, the, the difference is even more clear. So the expected increase of humidity indoors is 6 grams per cubic meter, while the actual it was 3.8 grams per cubic meters. So instead of a relative humidity of 6%, the relative humidity in the space, it was 45%. In that case, the ventilation effect of moisture buffering was 33 cubic meters per hour. In, in, uh, in the third study, it, was, uh, it is also a field study and shows the moisture buffering performance of a CLT under fully operational condition on site. It was some experimental investigations that took place uh, in uh, some house units that are built in exposed CLT and their uh, award with the Norwegian Architecture Prize back in 2017, a wooden project of the year of the same year. Uh, in that case, uh, the volume is approximately 148 cubic meters. It uses decentralized ventilation or that uh, is uh, uh, 38 cubic meters per hour located in each of the three rooms, two units in the kitchen and living room and one unit in each of the two bedrooms. In the bathroom, there is exhaust uh, ventilation run 50 at 50 cubic meters per hour for 15 minutes every other hour, or when the relative humidity in the bathroom exceeds the, the 50%. Uh, the interior finishings are all exposed CLT treated with diffusion open osmo oil, uh, except for the location of the shower in the bathroom that has a cement board. However, in the bathroom, we have uh, exposed CLT as well. So here you can see um, the, the variations of the relative humidity in the three uh, rooms. So in the bedroom, it varies from 9% to 44%. Um, in the, the bathroom, it varies from 80% to 66%. The water content in the wood was measured that varies from 80.1% to something less than 12%. In any case, below 15.4% that for this type of CLT element would correspond to a risk for mild growth. Okay. So there is, no, there is no risk for mild growth. Um, and then in the kitchen and living room, it would vary from 17% uh, to up to 55%. We must uh, notice that uh, the CO2 level, it was usually below 1150 ppm. However, at max, it can be up to uh, 1,500 almost. In the last case, it was just uh, a comparison that was used for exactly the same uh, units, um, these housing units uh, uh, in the CLT. Uh, we use some uh, numerical simulations in order to compare, uh, validate numerical simulation in order to compare the situation of the CLT, the nowadays situation, the built situation, compared to a hypothetical situation where instead of exposed CLT, we have uh, gypsum boards and we have tiles in the bathroom. So in that case, and I close with that, we saw that uh, the relative humidity, uh, the mean for the bedroom would be 6%. Uh, in the bathroom, for in the tiles, it would be uh, 9%. And the, in the kitchen would be 13%. While in the maximum, it would be 58 for the bedroom 98 for the bathroom and 63 for the kitchen. So in all the cases, it was the minimum relative humidity lower and the maximum relative humidity higher. Just to summarize, uh, so under normal moisture loads, the corresponding ventilation effect would normally uh, be expected to be between 20% and 35% according to the lab investigation. It seems that under natural conditions, the moisture content in CLT is not critical for mold growth. Um, the CLT managed to contribute to keep the maximum relative humidity indoors with these accepted limits. In the case of the field investigation, we saw that 
uh, we, didn't, we didn't see exactly the same benefits for the low, for the minimal relative humidity, this is probably due to the overheating that has negative consequences, not only for the thermal environment, but, but also for struggling uh, the moisture and not letting the CLT contribute with uh, moisture buffering for the minimum. And an equivalent apartment in the Gibson board shows in both lower and higher values for relative humidity indoors. So that was all uh, from my side. Thank you very much.